The numbers are rolling. Good morning. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures, commonly referred to as the King James Version, the perfect inerrant given by inspiration word of God. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures and read along with me word for word, verse by verse of the scriptures that we will be reading today. Read along with me. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures every day, daily. Let these things be so. Read along with me too because like I always tell you, um, my mouth will go quicker than my brain. So you need to keep an eye on me because guess what? I can make mistakes. Okay? This is, it's uh, 9.48 a.m. my time here. This is, I'm usually, you know, not functional by this time, but uh, you, you need to know this. Um, I had an incredible, <laughs> wonderful, uh, wonderful evening last night. I was, um, I was in bed by 6, uh, by 6 p.m., and... Um, Woke up this morning just racked with pain all over. <laughs> uh, the joys of the decaying skin suit. <laughs> but you know what? When you get to be this age, if you do, um, the pain that you feel reminds you, if, I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but it kind of reminds you that you're still alive. <laughs> that makes any sense. And speaking of that, Proverbs chapter 3. Today is the third. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but we're going to read a, a portion of it. A little, a little less than half of it. A little less than half. Proverbs 3, verses 1 on to verse 15. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Doing what God says according to the scriptures um, doesn't hurt you at all. Okay? The one thing that it does hurt is your pride and this sagging skin suit. Because the spirit is constantly lusting against the flesh, and these are contrary. And a life spent in the Lord, in prayer, in His Word, um, utilizing, as it were, the ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors. Living our lives for the Lord. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, right? But see, a lot, like I said, it's contrary to your flesh. It's contrary to you. That's what makes it beautiful. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. When your ways please the Lord, even your enemies will be at peace with you. And that's true. And that's true. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. What you say is good. Don't lean upon yourself, upon your accomplishments, upon how you've done, you've been this for so long and you've been used so greatly. You know, if, if, there's nothing more disgusting to me personally than someone who feels the need to constantly rub in your face their accomplishments. Uh, what pompousness, what arrogance, what... Um, what it's just disgusting. It's just disgusting. Okay? 
Am I wrong to be thinking that a saint shouldn't have to at least feel the need to do that, to project themselves about how worthy they are? When the world itself saw our father as a criminal, as a blasphemer, and our apostle as the same? Okay? Okay. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's a big all. All thy ways. And see, why do some people not do that? Because if you include him in all your ways, acknowledge him, um, he will tell you, uh, I don't want you doing that. But I want to do that. I don't care. I don't want you doing that. Well, I'm going to do it. Because, fine, go ahead. And then it comes to naught. Then we come back crying with our tails between our legs. Right? Who, who, who amongst you huh, can relate to that, huh? Be not wise in thine own eyes. I've been saved for 25 years. I, I feel like Paul. For all the people I've led to the Lord. Uh, all the people telling me how great I am and because of me. Yeah. Yeah, so, and I need to remind you of that. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thine navel, and morrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Now you got to remember, this is the Proverbs. This was um, written during the law, in a dispensation where it was faith and works, eternal security was not yet there nor the death, burial, and resurrection, or the blood shed on the cross yet there. So you got to remember that, okay? So they were keeping the law. And honoring the Lord with thy substance and the first fruits was part of tithing, you know, giving on to the Levitical priesthood because they had no physical inheritance. The Lord was their inheritance, and the sacrifices given on to the Lord were to go on to the Levites, okay? So that's a dispensational difference there. But to instruct us in righteousness... Honor the Lord with thy substance. You. 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 Yourself. You. Okay? And with the first fruits of all thine increase. If your biologics <laughs> enable you to. But regardless of that, the first thing you do when, you know, you open your eyes and... And if you're not like me this morning, it's like, ah! <laughs> okay, what do you do? What do you do? Remember, in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God. Okay? First fruits of your increase. Okay? Look at that verse. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of, thy, of all thine increase. Okay? You are the substance for our instruction in righteousness. First fruits of all our increase. What do you do first thing in the morning? Huh? You light that cigarette, don't you? Huh? Or you or you go for that cup of coffee, right? Go to get a donut, right? Right? Did, some of you might even have to take a swill of alcohol or something. Yeah. And of course, what can you tie into that verse? Of course, uh, y'all ought to know this. Romans 12. Of course. Honor, what, what does that verse say? Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Right? All right, so let's, let's, let's go to uh, Romans 1, uh, Romans 12. Hmm? You want to know this by heart, but I'm not going to butcher it by trying to quote it by memory, even though I could pretty well do so. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, verses 1 and 2, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable. It's reasonable to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. It's unreasonable to, it's unreasonable. It, it defies logic. I'm saved now, so that means I can double up the portion of being like the world. Because I just believed and so on. I, I believe, therefore I am, right? Crazy. Nonsense. Nonsense. Let's continue. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That happens every day. At least it ought to. <laughs> at least at least it ought to okay are you searching the scriptures daily are you examining yourself daily huh come on guys that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God who are you proving that to back to Psalm uh, Proverbs 3 Verse 10, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and all the, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. New wine. New wine is better. Right? Right. Okay. And remember, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which dwell in you, and ye are not your own? Therefore, if any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. Any man, that means you. Okay, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the Lord has that spirit. Okay, our bodies, not a building. So, instruction and in righteousness here, because remember, this is a dispensational difference. Because you can link this, like, check your margins. Is there a link there, uh, a reference for Malachi? Huh? Is there right here? I, I can't tell because I'm, Using a different, I'm using, I'm using this. See that? Okay. <laughs> this one doesn't really have references, but uh, I'm just using it. Okay. But so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. And then Malachi, it's like uh, bring the ties into the storehouse, and I'll open up the windows of heaven. Different dispensation. Okay, where they had an actual physical temple and priests that were doing the job of maintaining the temple and offering the sacrifices. Okay, so this is a dispensational difference. But like I said, to instruct us in righteousness, as we see in verse 9 and 10, okay, uh, what's the first fruit of our substance today? And what are, our, what are our barns? Us, we, okay? Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. And see, the Lord chasteneth us for our good. But the Lord will also chasten the heathen, but not for their good, but for judgment. And I'm not going to touch on that because there's a possibility that another saint might bring out something on that. So I'm going to leave that alone. But let's continue. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. And the man that getteth understanding. Now let's go there and let's look at the verse ourselves with our own two or four eyes. What are you talking about? What, what you don't know? You don't know, huh? Okay, well you're about to find out. Alright? You don't know. Look at that verse again. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. And the man that getteth understanding. Job 28, 28. And unto man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, the fear of the Lord. And the man that getteth understanding, departing from evil. 
For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. And here you have the reference of wisdom being equated to the beauty of a woman. Okay, and it's described in that way so that we can get it. Okay, all right, and imagine the most beautiful woman. Imagine the most beautiful <laughs> looking. Okay, how many of you, brethren? Okay, and hey, sisters, you can you can flip this about us. Okay, um, how many of you have seen like the most, just the most. Gorgeous, fine-looking woman. And you talk to them. <laughs> and on the outside, they are beautiful. But on the inside, they're full of dead men's bones. I can't tell you how many times I have encountered that. I, I can't. It, it's n numerous, numerous. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. <laughs> One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. The extraordinary, precious gift, the, the beauty of a woman who fears the Lord. Because you've got to remember, saints, you sisters out there as well. We, we have it documented. Where did, who did Satan go after first? So when a sister, a woman, a woman is saved and is a saint, that beauty in and of itself is like, wow, the fear of the Lord is even greater than that. See? See what I'm talking about? That's how it is. So, so and for, for you sisters, you know, you see a fine-looking, handsome man. He's got his stuff together. Right? And you talk to him. Then you live with him, maybe, right? Hopefully you, you do it the right way. Okay? Then you find out that on the inside he's full of dead men's bones. But see, in Scripture, wisdom, the fear of the Lord, is equated onto the beauty of you, the woman. And I tell you, a woman who fears the Lord, a truly saved saint, who is a woman, her beauty is <laughs> what you guys got? What you guys of the world, huh? You get the stuff flashed here on the YouTube. They dress the women dressed like whores and made them like, make them an object. Oh, but a, but a woman who feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And the fear of the Lord, happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding, departing from evil, is leagues beyond woman who fears the Lord, as far as beauty is concerned. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. Nothing that the world can give you. Nothing. Not a thing can compare to the beauty of the fear of the Lord. Nothing. <laughs> not a, not a cotton-picking thing. She is more precious than rubies. What's the she? The fear of the Lord. Wisdom. And all things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. And see, the world will offer you things of the flesh, the pleasures of the mind, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, right? But all that is just fleeting, goes away. Let's go to Exodus. Well, 
Well, in um, <laughs> tremendous, <laughs> let's say, let's use the, the phrase discomfort, dis-ease this morning. Woo-hoo. Um, a verse was given on to me, or it just popped into my head. You know, just, you know, where'd that come from? I wonder. <laughs> Exodus chapter 8. You know, you, you, you watch any of these things that the Lord has your servant to do. You, you know that I'm all about distinction. Okay, there has to be a distinction. And distinction as a word today is being blurred by the worst of the worst, which seems to be those of Christianity. Okay, if you if you get offended by me saying that, take offense in the gate. Okay, distinction. Distinction. Now you got to remember the enemies can kind of put on a facade of distinction, but that distinction being other, a new creature, comes from the Lord that dwells within us. Okay. All right, because remember, the changed life thing. All right. Yes, your life will change. But it comes from being a new creature. Okay? You get the change life, and I understand why people say, you know, change life, change life. But you know what? How many of these devils can fraudulently, fraudulently give you this appearance that they have had a changed life? No, a, a truly changed life comes from being a new creature. Okay, you, those of you who are sticklers for did your life change? You gotta know you ought to Okay, what brought about that changed life? Being a new creature. Okay. But distinction. Distinction. See the Lord in us is contrary to that. And the Lord in us is contrary to our flesh. Praise the Lord. Okay? Praise the Lord. And see, in that, contrary to the world, we are distinct, not of our own doing, but of the Lord that dwells within us. Again, how many of you saints have been in, I, I don't, uh, your nation, you can relate to this in a different way. Okay? How many of you have been like at the Wally World? Okay, and you're standing there looking at stuff, and the dude next to you covered in tattoos and whatnot. You don't even say a word. You just kind of be like, you know, give him one of those. And the guy's like freaking out and just distancing himself from you. Huh? Huh? How many times have you been walking down the road, and people just kind of look at you and say, avoid you. Now, you could, you could you bring up valid arguments like, well, Brad, were you wearing a pit buddy? Right? Right? Or, or you can say, well, uh, well, Brad, you are kind of an ugly guy. It's like, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the Lord in you is contrary to your flesh and contrary to that. Okay. Distinction. The Lord is the one that makes the distinction. Man is the one that wants to bring it in, um, you know, putting everybody together and blurring distinction. Look at the Tower of Babylon, or the Tower of Babel, Babel, okay? Look at that. Everybody got together. What did they want to do? They wanted to make a tower that reached unto heaven to make a name for themselves, the Lord came down and was like, <laughs> no way. So they left off. They did not destroy. It was not destroyed. They left off to build the tower. Okay? God is the one that makes the distinction. Not we ourselves. We ourselves can have a changed life. But it is God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, that makes the true distinction. Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 on to verse 24. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. 
And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. This is where, this was the one that the magicians could not mimic. They did the what? They did the, uh, their, their rods turned into serpents. Incidentally, rods came from wood, and wood, trees are not living in the sense that mankind is living, but you cut a tree, sap comes out, that's a form of blood onto the tree. Okay, a tree needs oxygen. A tree is in its way, in its whatever, is something living, not living in the way that man is living. Scripture even gives that distinction that, okay, a tree is not living as man is living. Okay, Scripture makes that distinction. But from the tree grows food, okay, for the service of man. The, Dust. We were made out of dust, remember. That's the key to that. We were made out of dust. So, for them, for the Lord to make lice out of the dust from whence we came, that's the significance of it. And that they, the magicians, could not copy. They did the, the serpents. Uh, uh, that They did that. They did the... Um, the uh, water on blood, water to blood. They also called up the frogs, frog legs, huh? But they couldn't do this one. The fake. The fake. Have a limit to where they can go and what they can do before they shoot themselves in the foot. Okay? It happens all the time. It happens all the time. And see, that's why the devils are so adamant about having you not to remember certain things that happened maybe three or four or five years ago. And when you got someone who can remember those things, they get a little scared. Yeah. Yeah. But the magicians who were able to mimic many of the, uh, the miracles, they couldn't do this one. Because remember... Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth. From dust thou art unto dust thou shalt return. That's the significance of this. We came from dust. So the Lord making little, little critters out of dust from whence we came. Okay? The rod thing, and that was a great argument. It wasn't an argument. That was a great point that you brought up, dear brother. You know who you are. But remember, the tree is not living as mankind. And, you know, Scripture makes that abundantly clear. But we did not come from a tree. We did not come from a tree. We came from the dust. So, and they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth. And it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. That's the significance. That's why the magicians couldn't do it. So, with the fake, most of the Christians, not all of them, not all of you, okay, not all of you. There are saints out there who, why, I don't know, want to still stubbornly call yourself a Christian. That's between you and the Lord, okay? That, why you want to do that? Beats me. Tradition, eh? Yeah, but whatever, okay? Let's continue. Then the magicians, uh, uh, let's read verse 18 again. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. 
And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. And we talked about this, I believe it was yesterday. Uh, you know, Pharaoh already, already in his heart, believed, in his heart, he believed he was, what, a god. Okay? The guy was gone. All right? The Lord just, like the, the thing about uh, Yuri Bezmanov talks about, about judo, you know, where someone tries to swing at you and you guide them in your hand so they topple on their faces like, hey, move out of the way, just let you go and use your own momentum against you kind of thing. Okay? Let's continue. And what are we reading to? 24. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground whereon they are. Interesting, I believe it is the Babylonians who called the Lord of Flies or the Lord of the Wind, Pazuzu. You ever heard of that name? Pazuzu? Yeah. Uh, if any of you, and I hate to bring this up, but if any of you saw, seen that wicked movie written by a Jesuit, no, go figure, The Exorcist, okay, that was based off of something a Jesuit priest did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go figure that one out. Yeah, but uh, the uh, protagonist, no, the antagonist, excuse me, in that was Pazuzu. Interesting. Lord of Flies. Lord of the Wind, they call him, apparently. Anyway. <coughs> and interesting that the houses shall be full of swarms of flies. You know, I, 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 I walk a lot. You know, I walk a lot. I do a lot of tracting. Hear me out. Do a lot of tracting and, you know, I'll walk by places and you can see that everybody seems to have one of these like 50 foot tall flat screen things that you could see from a mile away. Hmm. Virtually every house has one. Virtually every apartment has one. Okay, that, that, yeah, I mean, and we, some saints of us, we have them. I, we got one, you know, which we watch like Brother Alexander and stuff off of and listen to brother, uh, our brother from Croatia and stuff like that, you know, and listen to Brother Jeff sing that one, uh, one of him, he did beautiful job there and whatnot. Okay, and, you know, same with Brother Alexander. He's got one, that's his computer screen. Okay, but see, we, we saints, we're, we're using them for different purposes than to be entertained as the world is. But I find that interesting. Flies in all the house, and yet all these things of the world are in people's houses. Verse 22. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen. I will sever. In that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Verse 23. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow, shall this sign be. Verse 24. And the Lord did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarms, uh, swarm of flies. And if you know anything about flies, they like to regurgitate quite often. They could be harborers of disease and pestilence. They're, you know, they, the Lord made them. They got a, you know, they got a purpose. You know, a dead raccoon. You, you go into some place where it's enclosed, and you hear that distinct. Oh, okay. They, the Lord made them. They got a purpose. 
Okay? But did you notice here? Verse 22. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell. Verse 23. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And of course, for our instruction in righteousness, today you can compare Egypt that is given to us in Scripture in the Old Testament as a type of this present world, especially today. So we see here, for our instruction in righteousness, okay, that's imperative because... You know, this was under a different dispensation. We are not made right with God the same way as they were made right with God under the law. Okay? That's rightly dividing the word of truth. You, you guys got to gotta start doing that. Okay? But who makes the distinction? Hmm? Did not the Lord call Abram out from amongst his people? Distinction. Did not God tell Noah, hey, build an ark? Distinction. You know, you King James Bible believing Christians who boast yourself of your position, you've become the very thing that you've always wanted to be separate from. You have. You have. And you would be unwise to say, well, no, we haven't. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. In trying to be something other, you've made your... Listen to that. Listen to that. In trying to be something other, you have made yourself the same as everybody. It's the Lord who makes the distinction, dear people. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Verses 18 on to 22. John chapter 15, verses 18 on to 22. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, the Christ of Scripture, the authorized version, the world abhors. But you get this Jesus who's not angry at you, who doesn't judge you. God loves you. <laughs> Makes me want to vomit. He's got no requirements. Just believe and receive. Or go to the church that he founded. Or you're, you're his special little one because you're elect. <laughs> that, that is, that's a Jesus that is tailor-made for the world. Why? Because it is not the actual Jesus Christ of Scripture. See? The actual Jesus the Jesus who saves is hated of the world. Okay? Now, a lot of self-theists and Muslims and stuff like that don't like Christians. And I know why. But see, it's not generally because of the fact that they are representing that what is true. I'm, I may be, and some of you can make the good argument, Brad, you're giving them a little too much credit. I've had more fruitful conversations with self-theists in person than with any Christian, okay? I had, I've had glowing conversations with sons of Ishmael. Not that many, but with the ones I have. Glowing conversations, okay? More so than with a Christian. Okay? All right? Usually what happens is because the Christian, number one, doesn't rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? That, that, that's key. 
And that will cause the self-theist to go to the Old Testament and try to say, well, why is this? And you're saying God loves me unconditionally. Well, if you're not rightly dividing the word of truth, what do the what is the Christian taught by Rome to do? Philosophy and vain deceit. And then the the self theist and the Muslim who usually you know have enough sense is like, dude, that doesn't make no sense. See, the Christ who is. The Christ who is, is hated by that. Like I told you, the self-theist, the Muslim, those who are, you know, like that. Um, yes, they, they hate Christians usually, okay? But it's not because, like I said, it's not because they represent what is true. It's because... Number one, they don't rightly divide the word of truth. Number two, they don't have a perfect standard. Okay? So those who are without look at that hypocrisy and they're like, you get away. You know? Get away. Get away. <laughs> look at you guys. You know, not rightly dividing the word of truth. Which, which one is the perfect? Which one is the perfect uh, set of scriptures? Which one's perfect? You ask a Christian that? I said, well, the originals. The ones that were originally penned, right? That even your Jesuit scholars tell you don't exist. Woohoo! In John chapter 15, verses 18 on to verse 22. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. And they are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. Have you realized that the hearing them isn't always necessarily equated onto something that is good? Think about that. When a Christian, a worldly Christian, which Christianity is, uh, speaks, they speak of worldly things, they're heard. By the self-theist. They're heard by the Muslim. They're attacked. <laughs> Good for that, okay? They're attacked for the blatant, blatant hypocrisy. Not rightly dividing the word of truth. Saying God is perfect, but yet there is a that that one Muslim guy. Okay? I've I've I'm really starting to dislike that individual. He's my enemy. I'm his. I'm sure if he and I were to speak, which we won't, um, I'm sure we could be cordial. But uh, the more I, I watch that guy, I, I, the, more I, the more I start to despise his, what he's saying. <laughs> despise it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, even him. It's like, okay, you're call, claiming your God's perfect, but where's his perfect word? And he's got a, he's got a Bible that he's offering to give away now or something like that that's all color-coded. It's not even the scriptures, dude. It's a Gideon. Uh, I think it's a non-King James Version. And a brother sent a, a, a text message of a fire <laughs> burning the non-King James Version. There you go, brother. I like that. I like that. Okay? But anyway, let's read verse 19 again. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore the world hateth you. And this, this is just before the death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, This is not Calvinism. Okay? You know, you go the way of the cross. God's the one who does the saving. Just because you dot your uh, I and cross your T, okay, <laughs> all right, doesn't mean that God is obligated, okay? That's another thing that Christianity pushes on you. You do this, this, and this, God is obligated. No, he isn't. God's the one who is saving. God the one is the one who saves. Look at Shimon the sorcerer. The guy was never saved. Peter's like, yeah, your your heart ain't right. You're in the bond of uh, uh, iniquity and uh, something else. 
Okay, he wasn't saved. Okay, he was never broken. Okay, remember that. God's the one who does the saving. Okay, and he has a prescribed way for you to go to him. But so many put the door out the way, climb up some other way. Let's continue. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they, if they have kept your, my sayings, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Verse 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. And you read about the scriptural Jesus. He was very confronting. Okay? Like I said, the Lord in us is contrary to that. It's contrary to this, the skin suit, the sin suit. It's contrary to the world, which revolves around the sin suit. Come on. Even you devils have to admit that one. Okay? Because <laughs> that's all you devils are about. Okay? Back to Exodus. Let's go to Exodus now, chapter 9. Verses 4 on to verse 7 in Exodus chapter 9. Again, distinction. And who's doing it? And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. There shall nothing die of all that is in the children. There shall nothing die of all that is the children of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died. But of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. Hmm. Distinction. Distinction again. Okay? We are chastened by the Lord. So that, you know, we, we don't get, you know, number one, we are not going to be judged as the world is going to be judged. We're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. But we are chastened by the Lord so we aren't get like any of the judgment of the world. Okay, or be judged like the world. Okay? You got to remember that. But the distinction is of who again? And, and the verse that when I woke up this morning and <laughs> just wonderful pain, <laughs> Exodus 11. This is what the Lord kind of put upon, put upon me. Exodus 11. We could probably read this entire thing. So we will. Exodus 11. It's only 10 verses, dude. Okay. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Speak now in the ears of the people, and let every man borrow of his neighbor, and every woman of her neighbor, jewels of silver and jewels of gold, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of all, and in the sight of the people. Uh, people feared Moses. <laughs> he was renowned. Okay? By something he did? No. Who made? Moses distinct. Who did? Himself? Uh, 
And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord. Answer of the question. About midnight, I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth on his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. Verse 7, specifically verse 7. But against the children of Israel shall not a dog, and we see in Scripture that the dog, in Scripture, is equated to the male, while the swine, the sow, is equated unto the female. You read about that in what? Second Peter chapter 2, I think that is. I think. But against the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. And it's right there, his. See? Against man or beast that ye may know how that the Lord, the Lord, doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Instruction and righteousness. Those of the world and those of his body, the church, which is the church of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Especially you King James Bible believers. You're the ones that have made the distinction. And in doing so, you've made yourself just like everybody else. See, you don't need to start this special movement started by men. Well, Brad, it has it. Has it. Has the King James Bible believing movement really been that successful? Hmm? Doth not the scripture itself defend itself quite readily without having to make a whole little movement made of men, made by men, to perpetuate it? And all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out all the people that follow thee. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. And again, yes, he did harden his heart because Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart was already long gone, dude. Come on. You self-theists, you guys can even verify that, that the Pharaohs themselves, or excuse me, the Pharaohs themselves even thought themselves gods. And when you think you're your own god, woohoo, okay? All right? Who made the distinction? Go to Luke. Go to Luke chapter 8. Go to Luke chapter 8. The Lord's the one that made the distinction. Okay? We are in what is called the falling away. Now the falling away has been happening ever since the beginning. Okay? And unlike what some people want you to believe, a just man falleth seven times riseth up again but the wicked fall into mischief save people saints we fall oh we fall pretty bad and hard sometimes but the lost the false the infiltra infiltrators they fall away that they may be made manifest that they were not of us Lost people, infiltrators, 
they're the ones that fall away. And that has been happening for quite a while. People like to say, well, it's the apostasy, or whatever that Greek stuff is. I don't mess with that. But people like to say, well, because Christianity will be so messed up. Christianity is not the faith that was once delivered onto the saints. The faith that was once delivered onto the saints is doing just fine. The faith that was once delivered onto the saints is doing just fine. You know why? Because that is of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Christianity, oh yeah, it's totally messed up nowadays. Falling away because it is lost people. Okay? The faith that was once delivered unto the saints is not messed up. And those who are saints are not messed up. I mean, they're they're kind of, I mean, yeah, saints can get messed up, but in its in and of itself, the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, and we saints, yes, we have our problems, but in and of ourselves, we are of Christ. That's doing fine. It's the Christianity. Christianity. So I guess, yeah, they can, they're right because it's like in the last days, Christianity will be messed up. So I guess you're right. I guess you guys are right. Because, but remember, Christianity is not the faith that was once delivered onto the saints. It isn't. It isn't. Okay? All right? Lost people fall away. That which is not of God will fall away. Wow. I didn't even intend for the... <laughs> but then again, I'm not in charge here. Wow. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We want verses 11 on to verse 15. Luke chapter 8, 11 on to verse 15. If I can get there. Okay, am I in eight? Yes, I am. The parable of the sower. Okay? Let's hear what the Lord, how he exposited the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8. If you want to read the context, uh, let's read the context, okay? Uh, verses 4, and we will uh, read on to verse 15, okay? Okay? And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake a parable. He spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trodden down. And the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, and he said Unto you, it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, spiritual, okay? But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God, the authorized version, okay? The word of God. That's what we are sowing, okay? Okay? We use the scripture, which points to the Jesus who is. Okay? Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Hmm. And like I said, 
self-theists, Muslims, every other religion out there, they will hear the Christian and belittle the Christian because Christianity don't make sense, does it? No, it doesn't. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. Yeah. And they ha and these have no root. Which for a while believe. And in time of temptation fall away. See, there's no root. They just spring up. But nothing going downward. No replenishment. So, it's interesting because, what is this? They on the rock. What church claims that their church was built on the rock who they call Peter? Oh boy! I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> I wonder. Okay? And, you know, because they, you know, it springs up like there are some molds like uh, out there that spring up just, you know, without having any root because they're a mold. They're a fungi, okay? They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy and these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. There's no root. What, what are they going to draw from? Only themselves. So they fall away. They were never of us. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart the inference is that what our Lord has described thus far that was lacking in all of them. Having heard the word keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. You might believe sincerely in your heart that you're saved, but if you have not been broken of yourself and gone the way he has prescribed, you're a thief and a robber still. And of course, Second Thessalonians, which is doctrine for us today, Mr. Fig. Okay? Second Thessalonians, Chapter 2, verses 3 and verse 12, of course. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that is happening. People who were saying that they're saved or were of us, the saints, are falling away, being made manifest that they ain't of us. Okay, Christianity is not of the faith. That was once delivered on to the saints. How come self theists? How come Muslims? How come Buddhists and Hindus see that? But you Christians can't. Well, that's kind of a trick question. I blinded their minds. Yeah. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, letteth means to, to hinder, will let until he, the body of Christ, be taken out of the way. So the body of Christ be taken out of the way, 
the redemption of the purchased possession, erroneously referred to as the rapture. Okay? See, that, that's how you do it in person, pal. Okay? You're talking about something like that, and this comes up. You call it what it really is. And then when they look at you and you like, what are you saying? Then you go, it's erroneously referred to as the rapture. This is what it's actually called. Easy, done, go on. Okay? But no, some want to compromise in that still. Yeah. Yeah, deck the halls, pal. All right. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then, <laughs> body of Christ gets taken up. We, redemption of the purchased possession. And then shall that wicked, that man of sin, the son of perdition, be revealed. We can't be here and the son of perdition be revealed. We get taken out and then that man of sin, the son of perdition, be revealed. It's right there. Okay? Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Receive the love of the truth. Who is, what is truth? Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Okay? And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And what's the... Well, you know, people I remember were arguing about, like, what is this strong delusion? You know, what is it? I believe it's... It. What is the ultimate of all strong delusion? I've heard people, well, I think it's the strong delusion is the redemption of the purchase possession. I believe that they send them strong delusion that they, you know, believe a lie, that you don't have to rightly divide the word of truth. What's, what is the strong delusion? You read about it in Genesis chapter 3. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What bigger strong delusion can there be, dear friend, tell me, than someone thinking they are their own God? You tell, leave it in the comment section. Seriously. Seriously. Leave it in the comment section. What could be a stronger delusion than that? Hmm? The redemption of the purchased possession? That's just, that is a strong illusion, yes. That people are being lied about it, you know, that, they're, that people don't believe in it, okay? So, the strong delusion, that's what that means. It's like, well, people don't believe in the redemption of the purchased possession. That's the strong delusion. No. The, that is a delusion that these people don't believe. The truth, the fact of Scripture, which we just looked at, that we get taken out, then that man of sin be revealed, the uh, redemption of the purchased possession for the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? But that's not it. Rightly dividing the word of truth, that it all blends together. Most of Christianity doesn't do that. That is a strong delusion, yes. But is that, what? No. What's stronger than all of that? Seriously. What's stronger than all of that? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What, what stronger delusion than that? And and you read about in the Old Testament how they gave him, you know, how he would give them over to, you know, cry unto the gods that you are worshiping. Let them save you. It's like go ahead, you know, God. It's like hey. He chose their delusions. Okay, you read about that in Isaiah 66 or 64. Okay? What stronger delusion could there be than you thinking you're, you are your own God? 
And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews chapter six. Verses one on to verse eight. Now, did you catch this? In Luke eight, eleven through uh, we read more than that. But in Luke 8, uh, 11 through 15, that was under the law, wasn't it? Jesus Christ had yet to die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scriptures and shed his blood on the cross, okay? All right? So, yes, it was still under the law, okay? The law was still binding, okay? We just read in 2 Thessalonians, that's this dispensation, Mr. Fick, okay? Hebrews, chapter 6, which is written for who? The Hebraic Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble. Three different dispensations. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. Verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word, word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. How does one fall away during the time of Jacob's trouble? You take that mark of the beast in your right hand or in your forehead, you're done. Okay, you got liars like uh, Robert Breaker and Ken Helvin and uh, John MacArthur and stuff like that. Talk about, it's like, hey, what do you do? You lop off your hand or you gouge it out and you'll be, no. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. And nowadays, people who do not rightly divide the word of truth will come to Hebrews 6 and they will use that to try to say that you can lose your salvation today, but you can't. It's not your salvation to lose. Uh, but see, they always say that you can get it back today when they come here. But see, this context tells you plainly that you can't. You, you go the way of the cross. Brokenness of your self-righteousness. Contrite, having contrition, manning up. It's your fault that he died. And having the hell scared out of you, and you call upon his name, and he saves you, you're once saved, always saved. Sealed until the day of redemption. Catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not your salvation to lose. Who makes the distinction? And you got these guys coming around. It's come to here. It's like, see, you can lose your salvation if you're not in the church building every Sunday. Okay? You can lose your salvation if you don't give to the church or do whatever. Uh, well, yeah, that verse does tell you you can lose your salvation. But it also tells you you can't get it back. Why? Because you take the mark of the beast in your right hand or in your forehead, you're gone. There ain't no oopsies. That's the only incident in Scripture besides the unpardonable sin. And, <laughs> hey, Andy, uh, no wonder you're having a problem with the unpardonable sin, you wicked, perverted devil. Okay? Talking to, trying to talk to a guy like, one of you sent me, you know, one of you sent me his vi one of his videos. Oh, man, it's like I, I thought about giving a link to his but no, I don't want to get involved in that, okay? <laughs> don't want to. But see, this tells you if they shall if they shall fall away, 
to renew them again unto repentance. It's impossible. They can't be renewed. Why? Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Verse 4, for it is impossible. If they were, you know, were once enlightened, take the mark of the beast, you're gone. See, this tells you you can't get it back. And you got these some of these Christians. A lot seem to be of the Pentecostal and also uh, some of the Calvinists like to throw this verse around. But they always say you can reclaim it today. Uh, you try to use this, you can't. Okay? Verse 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. Look at verse 8. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. What did we read in Luke chapter 8? Huh? I remember a, a man who I will call a brother, uh, ar didn't argue, but brought up that he thought that the one with the thorns was saved, trying to <laughs> trying to justify a form of easy believism. Uh, no, no. In Luke chapter eight, oh, where is that? Verse fourteen. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. No fruit to perfection. The fruit that comes is perfect. Why? Because it is of the Lord, not we ourselves. But the fruit, if someone gets converted, okay? If someone gets converted, okay? I'm, what's more perfect than that? A sinner, okay, repents of themselves. The Lord saves them. Now they're going to, that doesn't mean they're sinlessly perfect. No, but it's like brought fruit to perfection, okay? The Lord saves somebody because of the fruit that was being produced by him through you. You see how that works? Okay? Now go to Second Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is part of my uh, devotional reading that I spent with my father. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 on to verse 12. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? By the way, I think of that idiot Scott. You know, Dressing himself up like the one guy. You know, putting on the facade. Making himself look good. Making himself sound just like him. Having the same mannerisms. Okay? Eye candy, boy. That's all it is. It's all about the eyes with these people. Okay? It really is. All right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi. Right. Wicked devil. All right, where are we? Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. Okay? And 1 Samuel chapter 16. Verses 1. On verse 7, the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Distinction again. Who to who? Who? Establishes the distinction. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he'll kill me. He will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. 
and call Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will shew thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town assembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peacefully? And he said, Peacefully. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, then he, that he looked on Eliab. I don't have a pronunciation key in this, so. And said, Surely, the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, body, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance. But the Lord looketh on the heart. God knows my heart. I believe in my heart. I believe in my heart. Yeah, do you, huh? Yeah, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. <laughs> I, I ran into that one Catholic lady. It's like, well, I believe in my heart that I'm going to heaven. Okay, what, and I, unfortunately, I didn't ask these questions at that moment. It's like, okay, what Jesus are you believing on? And what makes, what gives you that assurance in your heart? Because you're a part of uh, Christ's church? Huh? Because of something you do? See, you break these things down, and it all comes back to them focusing on number one. But this thing about the heart, okay, again, there's, you know, when someone, people, when someone has the audacity, the stupidity, and that is, that is, that's stupid. God knows my heart. Well, yeah, he sure does. Yeah, he sure does. Anybody who claims to be something that they ain't, somebody who's claiming to be a safe person says that to you, they're looking to justify sin every single time. Why else do they say that? Well, God knows my heart. You did something contrary to Scripture and you know it. Well, God knows my heart. Sure does. Sure does. Um, Psalm 51, just uh, one verse. Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, thou wilt not despise. Broken and contrite heart. What kind of broken, contrite heart do you have if you're boasting that you're part of Christ's church that he founded? Meaning Roman Catholicism. Which is not. Okay? Or, you're elect. You're elect. God chose you. Right? You're elect. And even better, because of your skin color, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, broken and contrite. My right buttock. Yeah. Or even better. Even better. Broken and contrite heart. You just believe and receive. Which, and those guys purposely jump over. <laughs> Brokenness and contrition. Fear the Lord, calling on his name. Hey, Mr. Sunken, I was saying that that's a work. What, what's the phrase that these idiots use? Oh, uh, that, yeah, that's a backloading works unto salvation. Wow. Wow. See, trying to justify themselves. No brokenness. No contrition. Okay? A heart that has been broken is a heart that belongs unto the Lord. Okay? That's not all the case, obviously, but we're talking in means of what we are discussing, okay? The one Catholic, Hispanic Catholic lady that I ran into, I know in my heart. Yeah. Safe people don't say that. They don't. They don't. The only ones who say that, every single one that I've ever encountered that say that, have proven themselves to be lost. 
Every single time. Without an exception. And here on YouTube? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah, of course, we got to hit this. You know, y'all, God, God knows my heart. I believe in my heart. Yeah, what, 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 do you, what do you believe? And these guys are usually pretty clever. They'll say that they believe in death, burial, and resurrection, and the bloodshed on the cross, and they believe in the resurrection. Talk with them. Scratch them a little bit. It usually comes out pretty quick. They shoot themselves in the foot. Look, Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I cry the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Okay? <laughs> All right? And, of course, Proverbs 28. See, we saints, <laughs> we don't trust in ourselves. Okay? We, we don't. <laughs> Our trust is on the Lord, what he did for us. Okay? <laughs> All right? Uh, we we are not in the equation, okay? If anything, we're in the equation to be reminded how disgusting we are, okay? But in Proverbs 28, verses 25 and 26, He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. <laughs> He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. The fool says in his heart there is no God. But see, what have they replaced it with? Themselves. He that, but he, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. And of course, one more stop about this. John 7. One verse. John 7. Verse 24, John 7, verse 24. John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Question! How do you judge righteously? Scripture. Scripture. See, man's judgment is flawed. Hello! <laughs> Come on, guys. Can't you figure that one out? Saints, you can. You, you saints can get that. It's like, what? Oh, well, no kidding, Brad. Man's judgment is flawed. God's judgment isn't. The lost call it flawed because God's judgment... God's statutes, commandments, precepts, testimonies, judgments are all contrary to everything they love. Flesh, sin, devil. Okay? Now let's continue in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's pick up at verse 7 again. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as, uh, as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a one think this, that such as we are in the word, such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. I have to say this again. This, you see, is what you would get if I met you out there. What you see here is what you get out there. This, this is who, this is me, okay? 
This is not a performance. This is not a facade, which I believe personally so many of these preachers, especially here on YouTube, okay? All right? What you see isn't what you're going to get. Here, you, you see this? Me, this ugly face, this rotten hairdo, okay? This guy who you see here is the same guy you're going to meet out there, okay? So, you know, <laughs> if, you know, if things come up, I, I will be confrontational with you. I don't fret, man, okay? I don't. I, I'm not afraid to get in your face. I will get in your face if I need to, okay? If I'm threatened, uh, depending on the circumstance, I, I will stand up to you. I will stand my ground. I got a wife, okay? So it's not about me, okay? What you see is what you get. With any of these guys, I doubt what you see is what you get. There are a couple which are frightening, like the fledgling of pride, what you see. I, I believe at least with that little punk, what you see is arrogance and whatnot is what you would actually encounter in real life. I'll give that little punk that. I will. Okay? Uh, I do. I think if you were to... I wouldn't want to meet that little guy. <laughs> I'm a safe man. I would... Not going to go there. But um, I bet if you met the fledgling of pride, that that pompous, snot-nosed little demeanor that he has would be just as present in person as it is behind a keyboard. I bet you. I bet you. I'll give him credit on that. I, I'll give that kid credit on that. Okay? I could be very wrong, but I'll give him credit for that. I'll give anyone credit. For being, like, for example, another, not a saint, but the Dade Murphy guy. Again, I, I use him as an example. He's a good example to, uh, to speak against, okay? But it, that guy, if you would meet him in person, the guy you see here, I, I'm sure would be the same dude. Okay? You can deal with someone like that. You can't really deal with, I mean, you can, but it's difficult to deal with someone who puts on a happy face and then when you turn your back, takes out the knife and... <clears throat> Verse 12 is rife within Christianity. For we dare not make ourselves of the number which King James Bible in Christianity has done. You have. And you know what? I think a lot of you already know that. I think you do. Or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Lord has me doing what he has me doing. I'm not going to compare myself to uh, my dear beloved best friend, Brother Alexander B. Hartley. He's, the Lord's got him doing something different, okay? I'm not going to, we're not, you know, this isn't a, a measuring stick match or something like that, okay? Like the Lord said to Peter, when Peter looked at John, he's like, Lord, what is this guy, guy going to do? The Lord said to Peter, it's like, if I will he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. You follow me. Don't worry about him. You follow me, okay? Don't worry about that. It's you and me. Relational, like we spoke about yesterday. Okay? Rachman. Rachman said of this verse, and I could prove this if I really wanted to, uh, because I still got those sermons of his, so-called. Okay? Where he said that you shouldn't do that. But, these are his words, but if you're going to do it, pick yourself a good one. Or a big one, he said. That's almost a verbatim quote. When Peter Ruckman, when it came to this verse, you know, that for we dare not make ourselves of the number, he said, but if you're going to, if you're going to, pick yourself a good one. Y'all kind of wonder why I have major doubts about that individual. <laughs> oh, major Major, major doubts about that individual. 
Okay, bless his heart. <laughs> now let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 12 on to verse 30. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. How so? With the eye candy. Judging themselves among themselves. Putting on the appearance. Taking on the mannerisms. Taking on even... Dude! Mr. Dudley do right. You even sound like him. You even use the same intonation, the same speaking pattern. You're a clone. <coughs> okay? <laughs> and then you teach veiled Calvinism. Okay? All right, but All right? And what do they desire? Occasion occasion to what? To gratify themselves. To be part of something. Right? What saith the scripture? For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Who makes the distinction? We've already seen it. God does. So the false will come around, take on the persona of somebody else, and put it on for themselves. That that that's called emulation. Uh, that 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 happens. That happens quite a bit uh, with not just King James Bible and Christians, but with a lot of Christianity. It, it's it's frightful. Okay, it's frightful. Because, because why? Aren't you all taught to imitate Christ? <laughs> Gonna have to put that one in this video in the description box. Aren't you all the word to imitate Christ? Imitate Christ, imitate Christ. Hey, find me the word imitate in the authorized version. Guess what? Okay. I'll give you a thousand bucks of, mo of money I don't have if you can provide this scripture with the word imitate from the authorized version. I'll give you a thousand bucks of money I don't have. <laughs> Let's continue. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know these, these Pentecostal twits and... It, it does seem to focus around the flavor of the Pentecostal charismatic crazies. Not all the time, but these people who say that <laughs> they've seen God. Seen, seen God, huh? <laughs> seen God, huh? Or you've been to heaven and hell, huh? So, you know, Paul was up to the third heaven, you know, where God is and he says that it's not lawful for man to even utter, but yet you can go there, come back, and write a book about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, roll you up another one. <laughs> up the dosage there, buddy. Yeah, yeah, you're crazy, man. But see, again, these people have seen something. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Within these three verses, 13 on to verse 15, you see transform three times. Who makes the distinction? But these guys are transforming themselves. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. Now, we immediately think in the religious sphere of these things, right? Naturally. Okay? Some of these guys, the sleazy believers, mm -hmm, very few of them, but some of them are very cordial, very forthright. Some of them. A lot of the ones that, I, that I've watched, I have watched on YouTube are just a bunch of obnoxious jerks. <laughs> okay? 
the best of them as far as personality is Mr. Sunken Eye. Okay, you, you see this? You see this, man? Yeah, there you go. There's your compliment for the day. Okay, devil. Okay, he, he's out of the batch that I've seen. He, he's the one that's at least the most personable. Okay, but most of the time, they're obnoxious jerks. Okay, but we put in the sphere there, ministers of righteousness, you know, like I was saying, some of these sleazy believers can be very kind and cordial. A lot of Christians are very, very nice. Very nice, aren't they? Yeah, and then, then, then you talk about stuff from the scripture. Yeah, okay, all right. The devil will smile at you as he pisseth on your foot, okay? Absolutely. But see, these ministers of righteousness, you know, and also minister of righteousness, who could think, who can't think of smiling Joe Olstein? who is one of the creepiest looking dudes I've ever seen. Okay, that, that guy, all that plastic surgery that guy's had to maintain his youthful appearance, that, that dude is... <laughs> I, I ran, up, uh, I ran up, uh, across that in an alley. I'd take a trash can and it's like, ah! Okay? Mind me and Michael Jackson, okay? But... Ministers of righteousness there, while we do speak, think automatically in the religious sphere, it's not relegated to that only. Doctors, medical doctors, Jesuit trained doctors. Isn't it interesting nowadays that a majority of the doctors seem to be those of the sons of Ishmael or of the Hindu uh, descent? Isn't that interesting? Still trained by Jesuits though. Uh, isn't that interesting? Doctors. Ministers of Righteousness. Your politicians, we won't, we won't even go in that direction. But yeah, politicians. Ministers of Righteousness. Oh, and Trump so righteous, huh? <laughs> and, and incidentally, I'm, uh, Smoking Joe is a buffoon, okay? He's doing what he's told, okay? Just for the record, I'm, not, I'm neither. Okay, it's a it's a it's a joke. Okay, well, let's continue. I say again, let no man think me a fool. Fool says in his heart, there is no God. If otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me, that I may boast myself a little. Here we're going to get into this thing where Paul defends himself. But look at the usage of fool here in this context. Fool says in his heart there is no God. To behave foolishly is to behave as if you say in your heart there is no God. Mark it. Get, get, get your pen. Okay, seriously. Get your little pen. If you got one of these, okay, use it now. Come on. Or, or at least write them down, man. Okay, seriously. Check this out. Okay, we see fool how many times already? Twice. All right? Keep reading. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Then we see this again. Why is it that I have seen certain Christians, quite a few actually, who are like on YouTube and stuff, always go back to this, what I have done, what I have accomplished, Look at me and all the things I've done. Why, why is that there? Why is that there? Oh, I wonder. <laughs> I wonder. But you see this again in the thing of longevity. Paul here, yes, he is. And see, these guys go to this to defend, defending themselves on a regular basis, dude. Okay, you get attacked and you, you get and you get you get frustrated. I get that. And you was like, okay, and then you get online or do whatever. I understand it. You're doing this all the time. Rubbing it in people's face. Well, I I'm an I'm an elder. I've done this. I've done Shut up. Shut up. That's disgusting. It's pompous. Why do you feel the need to do that? Why? To justify yourself? 
I think that's the answer why a lot of these guys do this. I wish you should see the uh, emails that I get, uh, the letters that I get, you know. <laughs> why you should give to me, okay? <laughs> Dude. Dude, what? Come on. That's grotesque and disgusting. And it's very pretentious. Okay? But see, now Paul, he's doing it out of duress. And look what he is, he uses the word fool. Okay? Hey, you don't know, what is it, Psalm, brother, Psalm 15 or 14? Psalm 53. Psalm 53. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Let's look. Okay? <laughs> what I'm talking about? All right? Psalm, uh, what is it? 14? Psalm 14? Or is it 12? I get that confused. We're about to find out. Okay? Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. No. There is none that doeth good. Excuse me. That's the definition of a fool. Scripturally. That's the definition of a fool. Remember that. And then when you get to Psalm 53, you see it again. Twice mentioned. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they. And have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. Okay? So, we know that about fool, and to be foolish. Now well, let's continue. Seeing, ye, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Remember, he's being under duress, being attacked, being questioned. Paul, let a, I believe, let a lot of things slide. But we, we you know, can only take so much, even Paul. And Paul had a pride problem. Paul had a pride problem, okay? You read Acts 21, I rest my case. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. Sarcasm there. It's like, okay, you, you're willing to put up with these people because you, you're something special, right? Right? For ye suffer man... For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. Third John. Third John. Third John. Oh, oh, you, I've seen the. Uh, you see this in like the Stephen Anderson dudes. Okay, you see this kind of thing. With the Stephen Anderson people. Jude. Oh, not Jude, excuse me, excuse me. Third John. 9 on to 11. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence, among them receive us, receiveth us not. I like to be in charge, I like to be the big shot. Yeah. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, would and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, diatrophies, but that which is good, and there is only one good, and that's God. He that doeth good is of God. But he that doeth evil hath, hath not seen God. And, and then again, the Pentecostals say, see, you guys say um, see God in someone else. Not that you actually see God personally, you nitwit. Okay? See, the Hebraic Jews, their sign for them today is to see their God in us. I'm telling every single one of you Christians, especially you King James Bible believing Christians, you think the Hebraic Jews, who we were grafted into their tree to make them jealous, you think they see what you have become and see their God in you?
Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 21. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein soever, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly. I, I am bold. I am bold also. Look at that. Look at how Paul is using this. Okay. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak as if I speak foolishly. Paul is like besides himself here. Look at it. It's like I speak foolishly. It's like I'm speaking like a fool. I'm speaking foolishly. Okay? I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? You can just picture it. It's like, I speak as a fool. It's like, I can't believe I'm speaking like this. I can't, th that's what, if, can't you see that? Look at, look, at, like I told you. From, uh, where is that? Um, from, from verse uh, 17, or from verse uh, 16, excuse me, up to now, have you noted the use of the word fool and how Paul is using it? It's like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm sounding like one of them. Keep patting yourself on the back there, tough guy. Keep patting yourself on the back. Keep reminding everybody just how important you are. Yeah. He who is greatest among you, let him be servant of all. If you were half of what you claim you are, wouldn't hear a peep about it. No. No. Aren't you a preacher now, huh? Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. <laughs> God wants you to be happy, wealthy, healthy, and no troubles. In labor is more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils by mine own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness. In painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. You try to tell Paul that, well, God wants you to be happy, wealthy, and wise, and all this stuff, and you have this. I have heard some of these whack job, Pentecostal, name it and claim it, nab it and blab it thing. I've heard them even make the reference that Paul just didn't have enough faith. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern mine infirmity. Second Corinthians 10, 17 and 18. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth.
Who makes the distinction, Christian? Hmm? Are you a new creature? Or have you just had a mere changed life? Hmm? God's the one who makes the distinction. And when God makes the distinction, it cannot be gainsayed or said against. It's undeniable. But when man, when you, make the distinction, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's going to be it for this little video. Still morning, too. Usually it's 11.43 uh, a.m. my time. Usually this is the time when Lord has me doing a video anyway. But uh, like I said, because of the wonderful night <laughs> that I had. Uh, thank you, dear saints. Thank you. Thank you. Your prayers are appreciated. Um, your blessings, your love, your mercy, your kindness. Uh, thank you. Also, to uh, brethren, please forgive me, your servant. I, I'm not, I, I need to get better at this. I'm not good at keeping up with people. I'm not. I have always been that way, unfortunately. And, and brethren, uh, like a, our dear brother Jeff, I haven't talked to him for a while. Uh, brother David, okay. I, there's so many of you I, that I haven't spake with for so long. Please don't think for a moment you're forgotten. You're not. Okay, you got a lot of stuff going on. But anyway, thank you. Thank you, dear brethren. I love you. Always praying for you, dear brethren, the ones that know about. And um, thank you for watching this if you do. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.